The vast oceans of the popular video game Subnautica teem with alien creatures, some friendly and some deadly. While the game focuses on survival, the life forms of Subnautica are amazing even when they're trying to eat you. Possessing fascinating biology, bizarre behavioral patterns, and hidden mysteries. So, for this entry into the archive, we'll embark on a documentary style expedition, touring ecosystems from the shallows to the abyssal trenches, swimming in the shadows of giants and evading predators of the deep. This series will reveal the biology behind these puzzling life forms and investigate how they differ from life in our own oceans. And although it's been a while since this archivist has done any fieldwork, I'll be diving into the perilous seas of Planet 4546b myself to capture footage of these magnificent life forms. So let's take the plunge together and see what awaits us under the surface. Beginning in the safety of shallow, warm waters, we find that stable conditions have led to a region crowded with varied life. Here you can encounter all manner of undersea organisms. One of the first lifeforms we can spot are the peepers, or rather they spot us with their enormous dinner plate-like eyes. These easily identifiable creatures have evolved visual sensors capable of discerning colors not just in clear waters, but in a variety of lighting conditions. This, combined with their surprising speed, means that despite being herbivores, peepers aren't at the bottom of the food chain. That distinction instead belongs to these creatures, the rather unfortunate looking gary fish. Docile herbivores that are remarkably slow, the gary fish make easy prey for most anything else in these shallow waters. All ecosystems, including the oceans of Earth, need something at the bottom of the food chain after all. Other common herbivores on 4546b include the bladderfish, which swims by contracting and expanding its translucent bladder. In the unusual boomerang, a horizontally symmetrical oddity that possesses a mouthful of sharp teeth to break down coral. On the subject of coral, the landscape of the safe shallows is dominated by one particularly unusual life form. These gargantuan tubes are large enough to swim through, and despite appearances, are very much alive. Aptly named giant coral tubes, they don't look much like the coral we know on Earth. These tubes have evolved to filter nutrients that flow through their center, and judging by their size and abundance, it's a strategy that has been quite successful. Gliding near the tubes is the elegant rabbit ray, the first of many ray species we may encounter. The undulating motion that the rabbit ray uses to swim through the clear seas is analogous to the underwater movements of various types of earth rays. But it's not the movement of the rabbit ray that gives it its curious name. Instead, the rabbit ray's most defining features are its twin orange appendages that help it sense vibrations. These ear-like structures resemble the ears of rabbits, and so the aquatic rabbit ray shares a name with an otherwise dissimilar terrestrial herbivore. Beneath the shallows twisted network of underwater caves. While exploring one as I was gathering this footage, I heard a strange noise. And then a fish exploded in my face. That short-lived creature was a crash fish, an evolutionary oddity that is difficult to study due to its highly frustrating habit of exploding when anything gets close. While an animal exploding to defend its territory might seem too outlandish to evolve, there's a model of such behavior on our own planet. Though uncommon, certain species of ants have been observed erupting into goo to block tunnels when their nest is under threat. Truly, nature is highly unusual, no matter the planet. Elsewhere in the caves, the far less bothersome shuttlebugs drift near the stone walls. Shuttlebugs are challenging creatures to make sense of, with three legs and three mandibles that have evolved into thin-like tentacles. Despite looking slightly unsettling, analysis suggests shuttlebugs are too small to be a threat to most organisms, and have instead adapted to feed on the waste products of the ecosystem around them. Leaving the caves, you'll see our first large species is waiting for us, the gasopods. 
These rotund, leathery beasts resemble Earth manatees, yet have a curious defense that is all their own. Although in no way hostile, when threatened, gasopods will nonetheless release a deadly cloud of underwater mist, which I can't recommend ingesting. Chemical analysis of gasopods tells us the poisonous compound comes from the bulbous appendage at the end of their tail. Since gasopods are social creatures, it's even possible they use these clouds to communicate with one another. But while the gasopods are the largest creatures in the safe shallows, they're barely the tip of the proverbial iceberg when it comes to Planet 4546b. Venturing into the vast kelp forest will find a radically different environment than the region we just left. Here, light is low thanks to the high volume of creepvine plants, creating a hidden ecosystem, just like kelp-heavy regions in Earth's oceans. Here and there, clusters of creepvine seeds cast shadows across the environment like natural floodlights. I find myself wondering just what might be hidden among the swaying fronds. That is a stalker, the largest predator that makes its home in the dense creep vines. These fearsome customers possess a series of dorsal ridges to help them make tight turns, and their long, thin snout is likely adapted for ensnaring fish, as it greatly resembles the effective, slender snouts of real-life gharials. Yet at the edge of the kelp forest, one stalker is behaving rather oddly. This stalker is picking up various pieces of scrap metal with its snout, only to drop them after a short period. This behavior seems to serve no practical purpose, and indeed, the stalkers seem to simply have a fondness for shiny objects. Puzzling as this behavior might seem, however, the barracuda, a predatory earthfish, is also known to be attracted to shiny objects because it's evolved to spot the silvery glint of the fish it prefers to prey on. And when one considers the common prey of the stalker, this attraction to shiny materials makes perfect sense. In the murky depths of the kelp forest, schools of fast-moving hoopfish light up the dark with their vibrant coloring. A brief study of hoopfish anatomy reveals they get their name from their antennae, which extends from the top and bottom of their heads and bends around their tails, forming a hoop. Exactly why these stunning fish possess such intense and varied colors, however, is a mystery. On the subject of mysteries, the last fish of the kelp forest we'll see is quite the enigma. Meet the hoverfish, a peaceful herbivore that appears to hover on pads at the end of its six legs. Using these strange appendages, the hoverfish glides on the undersea currents in a manner quite dissimilar to any other fish on the planet. It's surprising to learn, therefore, that the hoverfish may actually be a distant relative of the nondescript bladderfish, with their legs actually a highly derived form of the bladderfish's primitive vacuole tubing. It's the kind of creature that could only exist in the kelp forest. Just beyond the waving creep vines, the landscape gives way to an alien, grassy plateau. Here, the sandy terrain is almost completely carpeted with blood grass, as the sea floor is too dense for creep vines to take hold. And in the open space, even larger life forms are on the prowl. At the edge of the grassy plateau, a strange cloud of sand is gathering. As we swim closer to the unexpected turbulence, a creature with a huge fanged mouth lashes out. This is a sand shark, a predator with a distinctive hunting strategy. The sand shark burrows into the sand, then erupts out when unsuspecting prey swims by, ending the chase with a snap from its massive jaws. With segmented body armor and six rows of fearsome teeth, it's little wonder why these predators are so effective. And alien as their behavior might seem, some sharks on Earth employ a similar strategy in swimming along the sandy floor near the shoreline in search of food, although they of course don't possess the extreme tunneling abilities of the sand shark. A common target of the sand shark's brutal ambushes swims overhead. The spade fish doesn't look like much from most angles, but glimpse one from above and you'll spot its defining feature, a single cyclopsian eye. Closer analysis of the spade fish suggests it feeds on the sea floor, and its single eye allows the spade fish to spot predators above it. 
Its mottled green coloration suggests it normally hides among sea grasses, like many fish do on Earth. When a spadefish wanders onto the grassy plateaus, however, it is hopelessly exposed. On the far side of the grassy plateau, what appear to be tiny floating islands hang miraculously in the water. Upon closer inspection, these chunks of rock are all supported by colonies of the same curious life form, the floaters. Transparent gelatinous blobs, floaters are at once oddly beautiful and slightly silly looking. Analysis of these creatures reveal there are actually multiple microorganisms living in symbiosis, which we can compare to some deep sea species of jellyfish. The floaters' ability to suspend heavy objects, however, remains something of a mystery. Swimming close by the floating islands is a distant relative of the peeper called the Reginald. The entire back end of these oddly named fellows is composed of one large fin, and that fin's bright coloration appears to be part of a mating ritual. While it swims, the Reginald filters algae and other plant-like material from the water via four gill-like, forward-facing orifices. While this is a noteworthy adaptation, something looming behind the Reginald demands our attention. In the abyss beyond the edge of the plateau, the largest organism we've yet to glimpse calls out through the deep. This is a reefback, a leviathan-class organism that exceeds lengths of 220 feet, or 70 meters, and is, thankfully, quite friendly. Swimming closer to these gentle giants, we can see they're unlike any life form we've yet to glimpse. Possessing a thick exoskeleton, their shells have become an oasis of life. Adult reefbacks can support many ecosystems on their back, including many types of coral and small fish. And nearby this adult is a baby, a much smaller creature whose shell is not yet ready to support an ecosystem like its parents. I confess I spent some time just watching these creatures drift in their pods and listening to them call out to each other with complex sounds that suggest a surprising amount of intelligence. With the sun now getting low, it's time to venture deeper into the abyss and enter the foreboding final biome of the dunes. In this vast, empty expanse, life often flocks near hydrothermal vents. These great fissures on the sea floor release a rich chemical soup into the water, much like those that support life in the depths of Earth's oceans. But it's not life among the vents that concerns me. A terrifying roar comes from above. A reaper leviathan strikes out into the abyss. This aggressive apex predator possesses four mandibles at the front of its maw to drag in large prey, and at 180 feet, or 55 meters in length, a hungry reaper leviathan can take down almost anything. Analysis of the organism's biology suggests the roar emitted by a reaper is a form of sonar, meaning if you can hear it, the reaper can see you. Thankfully, it seems this reaper isn't hungry, and as I watch the deadly leviathan vanish into the darkness, I realize I've done enough fieldwork for the day.